Talk on the Gaza. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest today is Joe Lowy. He is the program director for the Gallery Running Club for New York City. Indeed, I first met Joe back in 2004 when I took his speed class. Actually, the Gallery Running Club is very, very special to me. I ran with them from 2004 to 2010, doing the long, slow distance runs. During that time, I heard many, many wonderful stories, from a woman trying to adopt a baby in China, from a woman who just had heart surgery, running for the first time to exercise her heart. These stories were just phenomenal, and they helped me to create the Gotta Run With Well TV show. I'm thrilled to have Joel as a guest. Thank you, Will. Listen, before we go into these great stories with the Galloway Running Club, let's introduce you to our audience. I was born in Yonkers and spent the first few years of my life in Ossining, and then spent the rest of my life until adulthood in Peekskill, New York, um, where my parents still live. Uh, it was a pretty normal suburban childhood, nothing too exciting. I was not a runner uh, in my entire youth or throughout college, but I was interested in theater and acting and singing, uh, and those people involved in that in school were, became my close friends, and mm -hmm. I'm still in touch with many of them. Okay. Well, where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Walter Panis High School. In, in high school, you weren't a runner? You no, not all, anything athletic. Athletic, Nothing you were into the, into the arts and theater. Yeah. Obviously, went into, on to college. Where did you go? I went to Binghamton, SUNY Binghamton. And what was your major? I had a double major in comparative literature and Spanish. Ah, I was Espanol. See? Cool. Now, after college, obviously you needed to decide a career for yourself. Mm -hmm. What was the process for well, that? Well, basically, part of my comparative literature major, I, I needed to be able to take literature in other languages besides English and speak about sort of national literatures from around the world. And the only foreign language I had any experience with was, uh, was Spanish when I was in high school. So I retook a couple of Spanish classes, but I needed the express route because I hadn't really gotten, uh, made up my mind about a major until later on. So I studied abroad in my fourth year, knowing that I would spend a fifth year at Binghamton and kind of having decided that. And it was when I was in Spain and was when I got back from Spain is when I decided that that was the avenue I wanted to pursue, that I really loved the idea of speaking in Spanish and learning a foreign language, and that that's what I wanted to pursue as a career. I wanted to be a language teacher. Uh -huh. Rather than a literature teacher, I really, I, I knew, you know, I wanted to be on the ground floor teaching people how to communicate with other people, and that oh was it. Oh my God, Spain for a whole year. Yeah, yeah. Well, a semester. A semester. semester. Yeah. Beautiful. Now you graduated after five mm -hmm. years, you're great in Spanish. Now I you have to do a job. I came to New York. I, I got my master's right away at NYU, and I was there. And right after that, I went to teaching. So I've had really no break from an academic calendar since kindergarten. It's always been like a September to June life calendar for me because I never did any other work besides being a student or then being a teacher. A teacher. So yeah. in NYU, again, no physical activity uh, to speak of? Right. That That's pretty accurate to say. Um, I joined a gym. I would go exercise, but I really didn't have any real plan uh, mm -hmm. for anything uh, until later on, until I was about 28 years old. Now, becoming a teacher is really, well, the demand is great, but that's really tough. What was your first school year like? So, um, God, I, I, that I made it through was really a miracle. You know, I did my student teaching first for a semester at a transfer school. It was called uh, Satellite Academy. Uh, and there are a few of them still around. The, that particular campus doesn't exist anymore. But, uh, you know, a transfer school is a school with students who have been unsuccessful somewhere else. And rather than dropping out, they were sort of agreeing to not give up on their high school diploma and went to a school that took a different approach to learning and could concentrate on what they needed and give them uh, credits, the ability to earn credits faster to catch back up. So my first experience was actually with students that in any other environment might have been considered tough students or, or potential dropouts. And uh, that really helped me for what was next, which was four years in a school in the Bronx. And mind you, it wasn't a terrible school, but it was, it was you know, a school experience unlike my own when I was in high school entirely. Um, but I think it took me about maybe maybe three years to feel confident. And the things that I figured out was that I really just had to have engaging lessons. That was it. It was really that simple. That, of course, you know, there's the, the factor of kids who don't do what you ask them to in simple ways. They won't sit down when you ask them to sit down. They leave the room without the pass. I mean, nothing terrible, nothing egregious, mm -hmm. but there were times where I kept thinking, my goodness, but how do I fix this? Until you wake up a couple years later after that and you say to yourself, you know, things aren't that bad. When I realize it, I had a pretty good day. You know, I had, I had, uh, 
I had most of my kids hand in their homework today, and I thought our, our in-class conversations were really good. And you realize that's just it. So I don't have the personality to be the kind of like classroom manager that would that would stand up in front of the room with a booming voice and just command attention. Uh -huh. I did it through my lessons, through just being an engaging teacher, and I, I love that. I felt like I, after four years at that school, it was time to move on because it just was. That's interesting. I have had other teachers, and they say the similar things. You know, the first year is always awful. It just is. You know, you really just don't. Nothing can prepare you, no matter where you are, no matter how great or terrible a school you're in, no matter how challenging it might be. Uh, nothing prepares you nothing for prepared. the, the, the pressure. But then, but then, like you said, you know, the light flickers on, yeah. and you, oh, I get it. I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. In your case, you saw your the class was half full. You know, oh yeah, a lot of students gave in your mm -hmm. homework. Mm -hmm. You know, they respected the, the lessons, and that was a positive. Mm -hmm. But you always get the feel that you know, <laughs> you never can reach your. You seemingly you can't reach. So what do you do about those, those students that are just impossible, you, you or seemingly trying. impossible? You keep trying. I mean, persistence is key. I think persistence for any teacher is really, really key. You just keep trying. You don't give up on anybody. You allow them to be opportunities. You know, there, there are students that, no matter what, are going to fail. And it may not be for their lack of, it may be for their lack of trying. It may not be for their lack of trying. Um, but the point is, I'm always, as a teacher, I have, and currently as well, and what I do now, I always make myself available. And I always understand that every single day, no matter how bad yesterday was a kid shows up at school every single day with an expectation that they may learn something today. Yeah, they may learn something, yeah. they may have they may be engaged, they want to learn, they want to be engaged, they want to have positive experiences no matter how difficult the previous day may have been. Okay. So you just remember that. You reset that button every single day. Okay, good. That's a good philosophy. Now you said at twenty eight something must have happened that you went into running. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, it was interesting because it was the year that I joined Galloway, which was 1999. I ran, you know, no more than maybe two, three miles at a time. It's just part of belonging to a gym. And I always, with my school, used to take part in the AIDS walk because it was something that a lot of schools do. It was just a fundraiser. I helped lead teams and conduct fundraising. And then one year, GMHC, you know, the organization that uh, Gay Men's Health Crisis that does, uh, sponsors the AIDS walk, were sponsoring the AIDS marathon, as they were calling it. And there were a few of these, I think, around the country. And this AIDS marathon in 1999 was going to be the Marine Corps marathon in DC oh. and they contacted teams and former team leaders and, and big fundraisers and said you know you've walked whatever it is it's a 10k walk in the AIDS walk you've walked now would you like to run a marathon we will train you you have to commit like any charity run you've got to commit to raising it must have been 3,000 2,500 whatever it was, it was yeah. um, and we'll train you and we're going to use the Galloway method and there's a Galloway group and if you sign up for us we, you know that was a part of the whole package so I signed up for this thing with my friend Luke uh, and then uh, I think they didn't get enough sign, uh, participants and the overhead must have been too high and the 3,000 wouldn't have covered the expenses of all this so they backed out and they said you can still have a spot with this oh, Galloway oh, with program. The, with the Marine Corps. Yeah and, and with the Galloway program you can still do it. And and Galloway was boasting like a 99% success rate, and they still do. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not the bottom 1% of people. Like, I can probably do this. And I just felt like even though it's not a fundraiser, I had gotten my heart set on running a marathon. I told all my friends, I'm going to run a marathon. And, Especially the Marine Corps. Yeah, and, and it was, you know, but having, having come from only running like three miles at a time to running a marathon was a big step. But I thought, if this Galloway program is claiming that they can do it, then I'll give it a try. And lo and behold, that year I did join. I did finish my first marathon that year, and I've been a part of Galloway ever since. Oh, interesting. Funny coincidence. Years ago, I had Ruth Gersky mm -hmm. in that chair. And he tells the same story yeah. about Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So he was there with It was you. a big year. 1999 <laughs> was a big year that a lot of influx of, of people came. And uh, Priscilla Chin, or at, at that time, O'Carroll now, was the program director then. And I remember her saying, because I think it was only in existence two years before that, like uh -huh, 97. Uh -huh. So and it was 1999 was pivotal. To that was the these... big year. That was when the program really took hold in oh, the city. Oh, excellent. Yep. So you just joined as a regular yeah. guy. Yes. Yeah. I've run with them every year since, though I haven't necessarily done a marathon every year. There were right. a few years in between where I didn't, but became a part of the leadership team in okay. 2012. Okay. Well, let's talk about the, the Galloway. You got the shirt on. It changes every year. <laughs> it does. It's a beautiful shirt. And you know, the thing about Galloway for me, I learned so much from the Saturday runs, mm -hmm. which is the slow, mm -hmm. the long distance runs. Right. Every, every club has those. But what was different about Galloway, one of the team members said it best. It's a judgment-free running. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that, really judgment-free, and that's mm -hmm. what it is. And the other thing to me about, and of course, during the day, during the weekdays, I would run with other clubs. Mm -hmm. And all the clubs say, all paces mm -hmm. are welcome, all pacing are welcome. Right. What I discovered was, if you're 12 minutes or slower, yeah, you, you, 
but you're going to be running by yourself mm -hmm. with these other clubs. Right. But not at Galloway, right. at 12 minutes, 13 minutes, 14 minutes, 15 minutes and higher, right. you would always find groups of people to run with. When I joined Galloway in 2004, the, 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 the one-walk ratios were like 3 to 1, 4 yeah. to 1, and the fast group was like 8 to 1. <laughs> I think you were in the fast Probably group. Probably not right then, but at some point. Well, I was in a 6 to 1 group at six one to point. One group. Yeah. But that has changed over the time. Yeah, so has. tell us from your perspective, because you've been there mm -hmm. since 1999, how has the Galloways changed over the years? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, everything you said is absolutely true. I mean, we really are. I think I've run like just like you. I've run with other running clubs as well, and I think um, I would never say that I was that they were they were not welcoming. Every club is welcoming. Every club is lovely, and we are all part of a group of runners in New York City. So my speaking of Galloway doesn't mean to say anything negative about the other groups. Of course. But I do feel like the Galloway Running Club, as we've now renamed it, is the Running Club this year. It used to be a training club. Training program. Now it's truly has evolved running to a club. running club. Absolutely. We um, we really do welcome runners of all pace. We've got people that train at 18, 19 minutes a mile, you know, and they intend to run marathons. And they know that the marathons are going to close down at eight hours, but it doesn't deter them because we give all kinds of support all the way up to people that are going to run sub four hour marathons, as I hope to this year. Um, and, you know, the, the concept overall is just that the the for those people who don't know anyway, the walk breaks, we take walk breaks at predetermined intervals within the run at a Pre, at a ratio that is prescribed based on general fitness level and pacing and a test that we do called the magic mile test, um, which I can talk about in yeah, a second. Yes. But basically the, um, the concept is that the walk breaks are recovery periods built right into the run. So that way, rather than starting at a fast pace and then slowing yourself down by the end of a run or a marathon because you don't have that steam, or even the idea of running just a simple, consistent pace, the idea is actually more aligned to uh, body chemistry and uh, that sort of effort and recovery period that is natural to the human ex human body when it's uh, stressed by exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of transplanted into a long run. So you've got periods of recovery built in with periods of more intense activity, those being the running segments. And that actually much more mirrors the body's natural progress throughout any athletic mm -hmm. event mm -hmm. and really will get you to the finish line in a actually overall more consistent pace mm -hmm. than just attempting to be consistent on your own, um, running straight out. At least that's what that's what studies have shown, and mm -hmm, that's what mm -hmm. my experience has been. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how the program has evolved. And by nature, just because there are walk breaks, it appeals to a lot of people who are, who are intimidated by running or fearful of the idea that they can do any kind of distance without hurting themselves or passing out or um, <laughs> vomiting or anything uh -huh. that they may be afraid of. And we show people that by doing it in a smart, sensible way, no matter what you do from the start line to the finish line, it's you and your two feet, right? Unless you strap on skates or a skateboard or or you know, hop in a cab. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between start and finish, and however long you walk is however long you want to walk, mm -hmm. you know, however you put that in there. But whereas people sometimes have a race plan that doesn't involve walking, and they end up walking at the end of their race, in our case, it's just planned. That's the only difference, and therefore, yeah, it's yeah. not your inability to follow that plan. It's part of the plan, and that's mm -hmm. what we tell people all the time when we're when we're taking a walk break in a race, and people on the sidelines who mean well say things like, "You can do it. Keep up." Keep... Our our pat answer is, "Thanks. I'm sticking to my plan. Thanks. I got a plan. No, I'm good. I got a plan. Thanks." You know, just so people understand, I'm not walking because I'm tired out or because I can't finish. I'm walking because that's a strategy. strategy right? Exactly. That's a part of my plan. And every marathon I've done has been that method, and I've done 20 so far. Excellent. Excellent. So. And of course, when the group. Uh, stops with that break. We got to walk to the cut to the side. To the side, exactly. People, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to get in, in the way. Right. But tell me about the. Um, I'm very curious. Like I said, the last time I ran was with the Galloway mm -hmm. was in 2010, and 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 there was talk. I think there was little rumblings about this 30 30 mm -hmm. that Jeff Galloway mm -hmm. was doing. So there was a big change right. in going from you know. The biggest group when I was running, I think it was two to one to mm -hmm. three to one. Mm -hmm. But now, what what is the biggest group? Right. First of all, you're right. Every walk break is now 30 seconds. It's not a one minute walk break. They're all 30 second walk breaks because, I guess, just through his studies and through the whatever tens of thousands of people he's worked with, probably more than that, um, you know, he is figured out that ultimately, the, he being Jeff, I know, <laughs> talk about this mythical he, Galloway, Galloway Jeff Galloway. In fact, his name is on your show. Absolutely, Jeff Galloway. 
uh, that you get the greatest benefit from the walk break in the first 30 seconds, that your heart rate is able to go down enough to where it needs to be to get the most of that recovery, and that ideally if you trim off 30 seconds of walking that you don't ultimately need, you can maintain an ultimately faster pace. But he didn't want to change the run-walk ratio specifically. So whereas if you were doing three minutes of running and one minute walking in the past, you are now doing 90 seconds of running and 30 seconds of walking in the past. So that currently is the fastest group that we have, 90-30. And our training pace is around 11 minutes a mile. Um, our race pace could be anywhere from 9 to 10 minutes a mile because to achieve race pace, we then adjust those ratios differently again during the marathon or, or half marathon, whatever it is mm -hmm, that you're running. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to speed up, but you're just going to walk a little bit less. So instead of 90-30 during a race, you might do 2 minutes and 30, you know, 30 seconds or 2 and a half minutes and 30 seconds, whatever it might be. Okay. Um, so your pace can stay pretty much consistent, but you're just, lim you're just adding more to the running segments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so all these ratios change. Based, It's all just kind of clinical study, clinical trials uh, on what he found worked best for the people that he coaches. Um, and that's, that's how it is. So now the largest group, to answer your question, probably the largest group is... 75-30, maybe 60-30. There was a big 45-30 last year. We actually, they go down in 15 second mm -hmm. segments uh -huh. throughout. So our slowest pace group currently is actually more walking than running. It's 15 seconds running, 30 seconds of walking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the group that people will, will you know, finish races at 19 minutes a mile, maybe 18 minutes a mile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depends. But, but they finish. That's, but they and finish. they feel great. They absolutely do. And there's no greater benefit to... Do, but forcing oneself to do more walking. Regardless, you've been engaged in cardiovascular activity for as long as it has taken you to get to the finish line. Um, and for that person at that fitness level, at that weight, whatever the case may be, with whatever heart issues they may have, that's an appropriate level of activity for them. And they finish smiling and they want to do it again. That's right. uh, wouldn't you rather do that and be able to do that for 10, 15 years than I forced myself to a seven hour marathon and I was gasping and I needed an IV afterwards because I was dehydrated. I mean, that's, sure, you, yeah, can, that's, you can claim that's a greater achievement, but it's not. I agree with you. That's the beautiful thing about Galloway. It's unique. And I guess the other positive thing, as you noted, Jeff Galloway is very much and still involved. He's, he's innovating. Much. Absolutely. You know, he's trying things out. It's, it comes out with, uh, in the old days, we had to buy a Timex watch mm -hmm. to do the, you know, the right. beef. Right. Now, now he's got, got the, a little thing you can wear the, your belt. Uh, it's a gym boss. Now yeah. he has the Galloway it name does. on it. It does. You know? It was just great. And like I said, the people that you meet on the long runs are from every facet of life. Uh, That's the thing I love the best about it. In fact, the last person I interviewed from Galloway, she's a vice president at JetBlue, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she was also happened to be the third recipient of the Joy Johnson mm -hmm. Award. We'll talk about the Joy Johnson Award and why you guys started it, which is a beautiful thing. And years back, Sarah Wordsworth was a guest here, and, and she told great stories. At that time, she was developing the In Transit musical, mm -hmm. which is now going on Broadway. Yeah, it's wonderful. So you have mm -hmm. artists, Doctors, yep. the woman I told you about, uh, she just had heart surgery. I didn't learn about that until she was sitting here. I liked the way her, her spirit, she was acting like a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. When we would go by steps, she would jump on the steps. <laughs> All her life, the doctors were telling her, her parents were telling mm -hmm. her, exercise caution. And she said, you know, based on the stories I'm hearing, I think I should give this marathon a mm -hmm. try. And I love that about her. That's why I invited her to come and talk mm. to us about it. She Same had ever. a heart condition yeah. from birth, and she found the right doctors, and the doctors told her, okay, now you can exercise. Of course, that was a huge That's transition true. for That's her. Great. What do you mean I could go and run? He actually found us because, you probably still do this, these clinics, mm -hmm. we were at Carshall's Park. Mm -hmm. And I saw this group of runners doing a running clinic. And I looked at them, and they weren't too intimidating. She great. did Marine Corps in New York, and she had a wonderful That's time. Great. That's I great. I mean, that, what a story. Yeah, absolutely. Dozens of these stories. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that was one of the things that inspired me to develop this show. Mm -hmm. It was just developed in 2010, and, uh, and I've had many people from Galloway here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the latest one, and, uh, and they all have wonderful stories to tell. That's great. Thank you so much for continuing this thing because it helps so many people. And I hope one day to, uh, to come back and do another we year would love you to come back. If oh. my knees ever <laughs> allow me to. You know, every club has uh, their special night mm -hmm. where they give out awards for the most improved. Mm -hmm. But you have one that's, I think, unique among New York is the Joy Johnson Award. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that award. 
Well, Joy Johnson was a, marath a New York City Marathon streaker. Five, 25 right. consecutive. I, which is incredible. And, you know, she was elderly, of course, and she unfortunately uh, died after one of the marathons because she had fallen and hit her head, I believe, and, and was just, you know, didn't make it after a couple of days. And I know she was a friend of yours. Yes, yes. And she used to run with the Galloway group each year for the marathon. She was not a New Yorker, so she didn't live here and train with us, but she would come. She'd ride on the Galloway bus. Um, I found a little picture of her that I didn't realize I, I knew her then, you know, from, uh, gosh, like, I wanna, like you said, I want to say 2004 maybe, an old, old photo of all of us sitting at Fort Wadsworth at the beginning, and there was Joy sitting there. I was next to her, and I thought, wow. Um, she was really an inspiration. I mean, she ran with such joy, as her name implies, and uh, just ran into much later in life and was excited to do so and always just had the most wonderful spirit. And we felt like what better way to honor her? You know, her passing was sudden and shocking. Um, it just was. No one expected that to happen. And we just, you forget that people aren't fixtures in the world and they won't necessarily always be there. So we wanted to just honor her memory by uh, giving an award every year to somebody who we felt like was was just who just embodied that, who embodied that love and desire for running and sense of humor and passion and uh, just joy, the overall joy for running. And that's why we started it. And we've given three George Johnson Awards so far. Rachel, who you interviewed recently, was the third recipient of it. He was marvelous mm -hmm. a recipient. And uh, he was very excited. He was there for the first one. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was wondering when she wanted, well, who's going to be? And he was yeah, in total. She had, she had no clue. There are people that become very sort of obvious centerpieces of the running program, pace group leaders and whatnot. And Rachel's a pace group leader. When we talked about it with the other leadership team members, those being Ruth Gursky and Denise Hidalgo, we were really trying to come up with this idea of who who does really embody that, who might not expect that, who can we also uh, highlight that was special to us, you know, that, that we want to continue to be a part of the running group for a long time. And Rachel just was that person, very quietly so. When we went a few years back and we changed the ratios, the run-walk ratios, and we were asking people to slow down and, and not train as quickly, it was something that at first she resisted because she felt like, you know, yeah, but but we can be faster, we'd like to change the ratios. And eventually she really noticed as she, in her own race progress that this was something that, that was useful, and she became such a great cheerleader for it and an excellent pace group leader, and we just thought, who better? You know, we now currently, so George Johnson is, we have we have a male counterpart award now as well, which is the George Tannis Award, oh. because George Tannis was a runner two who also passed away of stomach cancer last year. So mm -hmm. we now have two awards that are similar in nature. So Joy Johnson is given to a female and George Tannis is given to a male. It turns out, I mean, Joy Johnson was only coincidentally given to a female so far, but that wasn't by design. When, once we added George's award, we decided that we would do both as well. Oh, so sweet. Yeah. And when so, did you start the George Tannis? Last Tannis? year. Mike Herskovitz was the first, I think you may know who he is. Oh, he was yes, the first yes, recipient yes, of yes, that award. He was sort of retiring from marathon running at that point too. He had done 26. Those awards are very, very meaningful, especially yeah. on, a, on a club level. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they tr clubs try to do it on, on a bigger level, and they just peter out because, right. for whatever reason, right. uh, it just doesn't happen. But if you do it on a club level, I know the family is so appreciative. Mm -hmm. You know, her daughter That's really, great. I'm happy to hear that. really looks forward I to hearing so. about the next recipient. <laughs> Good. What are some of your challenges? Coming up, athletically speaking, you're going to do, you said you did New York 10 times. Sounds like it's a tradition. It is. I'm doing it again this year. Well, my challenges right now are just to try to keep running well. That's really it. I mean, I don't have it. I don't, I don't see myself getting any faster. I really don't. I'm going to try to break four hours this year. I, uh, I hope I can. So the last four? two, yeah, I hope so. I've done it before. Um, the last year's New York, I didn't, and then I had done uh, Nashville in April, at the end, very end of April this year. It's one of the Rock and Roll Series marathons, and I didn't break four either. But I was recovering from shoulder surgery, not running related, uh, and so I wasn't. I didn't expect to. But at this point, I hope to be back in full health and to still just kind of keep uh, whatever fitness level I have right now. Um, if I end up getting faster in life, that's great. But that's not my goal. I'm just okay. trying, to trying to keep healthy it. and to run, I want to run, I want to be like Joy. I want to run until I'm 90 years old. I really do, I want to run until I can't anymore, plain and okay. simple. All right, cool. I know a bunch of Galloweyans of Boston qualified mm -hmm. using the one walk. Mm -hmm. Would that give you a close to the Boston qualifier? Not close, no, <laughs> not this age. No, not even close. I think I had to be 55, I'm 44 right now. I think 55 or 60 maybe at the speed that okay, I'm running. Okay, so you gotta keep your speed. I'd have to keep it until then, exactly, right? No, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, if I ever do Boston, it's much more likely I would do it for charity. It's not likely that I would qualify, but who knows? I hope so, I hope I, hope I can keep running till I'm of an age and, and a pace that lines up and I can well, qualify. I, I think but. attitude, makes a big difference and, and maintaining good running mm -hmm. running skills or good running mechanics and you know this one walk thing 
definitely helps on the recovery. Diet always plays a role, mm. which we didn't get it to. In fact, I know all the clubs, and you guys do, you guys have nutritional clinics, all kinds of clinics, Q clinics yeah. uh, you know, staying healthy clinics, Absolutely. movement clinics. Still going strong. We have those every year, yep. Yep, yep, and you guys utilize the Upper West Side, Jack Rapids, mm -hmm. they have that little studio. Yep. When I was doing Galloway, I I think most of the time it was just Saturdays, but I think now you added Thursdays. We actually have Mondays and Thursdays now. Mondays, uh, the runs are just hosted out of one of our members' homes, basically. We meet up. That's that's for people who live on the east side. It's easier there. But they, it's their little home base. They change. They get ready to go out. They do that. And then uh, we have Thursday nights at Jackrabbit on the Upper West Side. Yeah. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And then I guess on, on Saturdays, usually the pace leaders will have a brunch with the group. You know? We do. We still often, depending on where we end and whatever else we like to have. We, oh. We're much more social than we used to be as well. Okay, great. I love hearing of that. And now professionally, you're, you said you're an assistant principal. Correct. Now, where does an assistant principal go up? Are you the back, I guess you're the back, back up with the principal? <laughs> Well, right. I mean, my school currently only has one assistant principal now, so the principal and myself. And I would like to be a principal someday. Uh, you know, I'm not in any rush because there's really, you know, that, that I see is the end for me. I don't see going any further in the system than being a principal. And I, I want to be at a school. You know, that's what I love. Um, so at some point, if that becomes an option for me, I would certainly uh, like to take it. But right now, I'm not looking around anywhere else. I'm just happy to be at my school. And if that opportunity opens up at my school, I will certainly uh, which, hope to be considered anyway. And which school is it now? It's called the New York City Museum School. I think it's, it's unique. Every, you do something special every Wednesday. Right, every Wednesday. Well, so we're called the Museum School because of a partnership. we have a partnership with currently four museums in the city. Uh, and every Wednesday, students go out to a museum or some other cultural institution or place of research uh, and study. They take a class in one of those places every Wednesday. Uh, and students in grades 9, 10, and 11 do that. Wow, and they travel, I guess, by subway? By subway, exactly. Have you lost a student yet? Uh, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> never. Not, not yet. Hopefully we will never have to do that. Do you go with them? Or? Uh, sometimes I do. Oh, I'd okay. like to try to go. As well. I, I can't get out as much as I'd like to, but I certainly love to. And I've taught a lot of those museum-based courses when I was a teacher at the school, too. Oh, okay. I do kind of instruct a running club, speaking of running after school on uh, Thursday afternoons. So that's something. It, it's teaching, in effect, and oh, kids course. get phys ed credit oh, for it. Cool. So but where, we really exercise. Where do just, you meet? Uh, we meet in the school, typically, but then we go out. Because I'm on 17th between 8th and 9th, which is a quick shot over to the West Side Highway. So we run on the Greenway over there, um, usually. Sometimes we run up to near Chelsea Piers, and we do laps up there. Oh, great. And yeah. Well, Joe, that's very interesting. What's the, what's the size of the school? You said it's co-ed. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the percentages between kids and girls? Uh, it's pretty even. I I think it's something like 51% girls, 49% boys. But overall, there are about 450 students in the school total, uh, grades 9 through 12. Oh, cool. We've got to talk about this son, <laughs> because I always see uh -huh. uh, he must be in some social program because you would post things about, let's help Joshy, Joshua or Joshy uh -huh. on, some, on something. What's that about? It's usually with school. I mean, he's got certain fundraisers that he does at school. Um, you know, they'll do a book a thon, a read a thon, or a walk a thon, or whatever they do in his school. He's going into second grade this year. He's doing great, you know. Running is not necessarily his sport. Baseball at the moment is, but uh, he goes on runs with me occasionally. It's funny, even just this morning, he asked me to wake him up as early as I get up to go running, which of course I'm not going to do. But I get up at 5 a.m. and this point he's asleep. But uh, no, he's he's great. I mean, he's he's you know great. he's what gives us gives everything else meaning. You know? Oh, great! Excellent, excellent. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming well, in. Well, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I